Gaat u zitten, please be seated. Ik open deze openbare vergadering van het college van decanen met het uitspreken van het votum. Onze hulp is in de naam des heren die hemel en aarde gemaakt heeft. Hartelijk welkom allemaal. Het is de tweede keer dat ik nu zoiets voorzit waarbij er weer mensen aanwezig zijn. Dat doet mij deugd. Vol is het nog niet, dat mag nog niet. Vanaf maandag wel, heb ik begrepen, maar nu nog niet. Fijn dat u er bent bij deze plechtige gelegenheid 
waarbij uh, mijn collega Hans Koster een, een zijn leeropdracht aanvaardt met het uitspreken van een oratie. Uh, hij is hoogleraar of professor in Urban Economics and Real Estate. En zijn uh, lezing is, heeft de titel Reinventing Cities, Evaluating Effective Urban Policies. Aan jou de eervol, eervolle taak je reden uit te spreken. Dear Rector Magnificus, ladies and gentlemen, cities are a very old phenomenon and argued by many, one of the greatest human inventions. The first cities arose in the fertile lands of the delta of the river Euphrates in what is now known as Iraq. The birth of cities occurred more than 5,000 years ago. And ever since, people seem to increasingly flock to cities. A few years ago, human mankind reached a new milestone, as more than 50% of the people lived in cities. By 2050, this is expected to increase to two-thirds of the world's population. Hence, the future of mankind is an urban one. Most of the action in terms of urban growth and development is in Africa. Cities like Lagos, Dar es Salaam and Kinshasa already have more than 10 million inhabitants, but still grow with more than 4% a year. This means that each day an astonishing number of 1200 people arrive in these cities to plan to make a living in these places. The historian Ben Wilson shows in a recent book, Metropolis, that throughout the centuries, different cities have thrived. While in 2000 before Christ, Babylon was the largest city, it was Rome around the beginning of the common era. Nowadays, Tokyo is the largest megalopolis with about 14 million inhabitants. Where some cities thrive, others decline. The example of Detroit is well known. The decline, decline of the car manufacturing led Detroit to decrease from about 2 million inhabitants in 1950 to about 680,000 in 2020. Also closer to home, cities have prospered and declined. Kampen, for example, was one of the most important cities in the 15th century in the Netherlands, but it is now a medium-sized, rather unimportant, albeit beautiful town. Cities seem, seem to reinvent themselves all the time. Professor Ed Glazer, for example, argues that Boston in the United States was, was an important maritime trading and fishing empire in the 19th century. While today, it is the place where some of the most prestigious universities in the world are located within close vicinity. In the Netherlands, Utrecht was long its religious capital ever since Willy Brood was the Bishop of Utrecht. However, now it is one of the highest skilled cities in the Netherlands and it hosts several important ICT firms. We shouldn't underestimate the role of policies in cities being able to reinvent and develop themselves. Ever since the birth of cities, humans have tried to impact and influence the development of cities by providing defense and safety works, by investing in better transportation networks, by imposing strict urban planning rules and by devising policies that reduce crime, air pollution, traffic congestion, and improve the quality of the building stock. Some of these policies have been effective, while others may have been a huge waste of money. While pol policymakers and politicians alike talk a lot about what policies should be implemented, often little is known about the ex post effectiveness of those policies. This is worrisome because when we would know what really works, more effective policies could be devised to make cities better places to live. To put it differently, we should not only talk about a design of new policies, but also about how policies in the past played out. To illustrate my point, 
If you type in policy design in Google, you obtain 5.6 billion hits. While if you type in policy evaluation, you get only 612 million, which is just over 10%. Apparently, policy evaluation is not particularly sexy. Well, academics in general, and urban economists in particular, do not necessarily aim to be sexy anyway. Which may be the reason why the field of urban economics is particularly concerned with policy evaluation. I think for at least two reasons. First, economists generally are obsessed with trade-offs. Policies always involve a trade-off as policymakers can invest money into a high-speed rail line or into better healthcare, into new housing or into preservation of nature. Also, people make trade-offs all the time. For example, they can live in a small, expensive house in Amsterdam and have a short commute, or live in a large and cheaper home in Steenwijk or Didam, and have a harder time to find a suitable job nearby. To make the trade-offs insightful, economists tend to express everything in money terms, as to make a sound comparison between costs and benefits. So please note that economists are, maybe surprisingly to some people, are not obsessed with money per se. But to say something on whether a policy is a good idea, we use money as a numerator. This is not entirely without problems, and scholars like Michael Sandel caution that expressing everything in money terms may corrupt its intrinsic value. On the other hand, in many contexts, scrutinizing trade-offs in money terms is very helpful and actually may help taking better policy decisions in the future. A particular trade-off urban and real estate economists are interested in is the trade-off where to live and how much to pay for this. More specifically, we often look at house prices because they say th something on whether and how much people value housing and neighborhood quality, which is otherwise very hard, if not impossible to quantify. Let me explain why house price differentials are useful. Imagine you have to buy a house and you compare two houses that are identical except for one characteristic, which is, for example, the vicinity of a park. Then we would argue that we can interpret the difference in prices as the willingness to pay for a park. If we sum the total willingness to pay of homeowners for nearby parks, we get a pretty good idea on whether investments in parks generate positive effects on their surroundings. Usually, high house prices are considered as bad because it means that affordability is lower. But please be aware that higher house prices in this specific context are a good thing because it signals that houses, locations, or neighborhoods are more attractive. The main problem, however, is to find two identical homes in all aspects, but the quality of nearby parks. The challenge of mismeasuring the effect of interest is what economists refer to as an endogeneity problem. Particularly in studies to spatial policies, endogeneity issues are prevalent because it is impossible to observe all the relevant characteristic, characteristics of a location or property. In all studies, I will discuss later, we mitigate these endogeneity issues using econometric tricks, such as using a difference in differences setup, an instru instrumental variables approach, using uh, regression discontinuity design, or a combination of these approaches. I will not bother you with these tricks today, but believe me that we really thought hard and deep about causality in all these studies. The second reason why urban economists like policy evaluation is that many of us are obsessed with quantitative models. In reality, many changes occur at the same time. So it is often really hard to distinguish the effects of a policy from other things that are going on. Economists therefore always have to make simplifying assumptions. And indeed, the models they are, they are using are simplified descriptions of reality. People from outside the field sometimes think that economists actually believe that their assumptions are true. 
For example, we sometimes make the assumption that people are rational. Of course, in reality, people are far from rational, but in certain contexts, the assumption of rationality may be pretty innocuous. Today, based on my own quantitative research in the last years, I will discuss the often unintended effects of policies and investigate which urban policies seem successful and which doesn't. I make a distinction between policies that affect the livability of cities, the sustainability of cities, and the accessibility of cities. But first, let's set a step back and think about a minute why cities exist in the first place. As it is quite a miracle that humans have such a strong tendency to concentrate. It is not that there is too little space on Earth. For example, Gao and O'Neill estimate in their 2020 study that the total amount of urban land is just below 1% of the global land availability. Sure, many areas are not very suitable to live. But at the same time, humans have showed that successful cities can emerge at the most unlikely locations, such as above 2,500 meters, like Bogota, in the middle of Lagoon, Venice, in the middle of the desert, Riyadh, or below sea level, Amsterdam. So again, why do people want to locate where others are? Alfred Marshall already argued in the 1890s that the fundamental reason why cities exist is that cities imply a reduction in transportation costs. Reduction in transportation costs of goods, people, and ideas. Imagine for a second a world without transport costs. If you would be able to meet your colleagues, friends in person, visit the theater, or discuss a business proposal with a client without any cost of getting there, there would be absolutely no reason to pay higher real estate prices in cities or commute long distances and one could essentially live anywhere. Urban economists refer to reduction in transportation costs of goods that cities provide um, as agglomeration economies. In several studies, I've investigated whether these agglomeration economies are important, also for the Netherlands. For example, in a 2006 study in Economica with Jos van Ommer and Piet Rietveld, we show that agglomeration economies are important, but interestingly, we find that these are particularly relevant for the retail sector. In a more recent paper in the Journal of Urban Economics, again with Jos van Ommere and Ilias Pasides, we confirmed this finding. The reason is that when people do shopping, they, pref they prefer to visit multiple shops at once. In this way, shops benefit from each other's presence. We then argue that policies that encourage retail firms to locate close to each other, for example, in city centers, can be a good idea. The nature of agglomeration economies arguably changes over time. In the past, the main reason why firms cluster over space was probably to save on transportation costs of goods. However, given the dramatic drop in these transport costs, we would expect that firms cluster for other reasons nowadays. Together with Mathieu Stein and Frank van Oort, we studied this in more detail by measuring the reasons for clustering of the manufacturing industry in the United States. Interestingly, we find evidence that over the course of almost 50 years, the reasons why firms cluster have changed. Nowadays, the exchange of business ideas and innovations is the most important reason why firms of different industries want to be located in close vicinity of each other. An illustration of this finding is the cluster of ICT firms in Silicon Valley or in Bangalore, India. Despite advanced and easy online communication technologies, such as Skype, Zoom, and Teams, which we're all familiar with now, apparently physical proximity is still very important. Last year, we have experimented abundantly with teleworking. On top of that, the closing of cafes, restaurants, and bars implied a strong reduction in the benefits of living in cities, while real estate prices and rents were still very high. 
teleworking will most likely keep being more important in the near future, meaning that people can live further from their work than before. Indeed, a recent study by Bloom and co-authors provides some initial evidence for the United States that people start moving from central cities to suburbs. It doesn't mean, however, that cities become obsolete. A long history has shown that cities are very resilient to epidemics and other large shocks, including large changes in communication and transportation technologies. The aforementioned discussion highlights the importance of the benefits of agglomeration. However, when people and firms locate in close vicinity, this in inevitably leads to problems. A high concentration of people often implies that many cars leading to traffic congestion, air pollution, and environmental degradation. It also means that problems may arise related to crime, the decline in the quality of the building stock, and decline in quality of open spaces. Several policies have been devised to improve the livability, sustainability, and accessibility of cities. So let's first focus on policies that try to Im improve the livability of cities. Many Dutch cities have their origins in the past. And by walking around, which I did a lot in the last year, one may notice that many buildings are old. In the Netherlands, the average age of buildings is almost 50 years. And 15% of the buildings are 80 years or older. Well, historic buildings may be nice to look at, and increase the quality of the build, built environment, but at the same time, they require high maintenance costs. The government spends each year about 100 million euro to keep historic buildings in, and structures in proper shape. The question is whether this pays off and whether people really value those huge investments. In a paper together with Jan Raundal, published in Economic Journal, we investigate the effects effects of investments in historic buildings on house prices. We construct an instrumental variables based on the type of historic buildings that may receive subsidies given the yearly available budget each year. We find that prices of houses in areas with improved cultural heritage increase. A 1 million euro increase in the investments per square kilometer, which is about standard deviation, increases prices by 1.5 to 3%. If we then sum all the price increases around targeted objects, we find that the investments in cultural heritage generate substantial benefits that exceed the initial subsidies by a factor two to four. In other words, subsidies to preserve and sustain cultural heritage seem like a good idea. However, protection of cultural heritage is not only beneficial, it also has its downsides. The main cost is that when historic buildings cannot be teared down, this also means that no new and often taller buildings are allowed to be constructed, neither on the site itself nor in the immediate surroundings. The strong restrictions on supply mean that housing, offices, and retail become more expensive. For example, the historic city center of Amsterdam looks absolutely stunning. But it also means that we cannot construct tall apartment buildings there to improve housing affordability. In a study together with Gerard Derricks on London, we aim to get more insight in this effect by making use of a somewhat dubious quasi experiment. It's bombing during the Blitz in World War II. Using precise data on where bombs fell, we show that these bombings are essentially random over space. We show that current buildings are substantially lower and older in areas that were not much bombed. Because the density in heavily bombed areas is considerably higher, this also means that the potential for agglomeration economies in areas like the Docklands is stronger. By setting up a general equilibrium model, we calculate that the increase in density due to bombing implies a gain in overall productivity of 10%. This may seem like a very cynical paper as it shows that bombing of a city yields positive effects. 
However, that shouldn't be the takeaway of this paper. What the study shows is that the unintended effects of cultural heritage preservation can be large, at least for London, where land prices are towering and agglomeration economies are paramount. The government does not only invest in historic buildings, but also in buildings in deprived neighborhoods. Just a couple of months ago, a group of 50 mayors argued that the national government should invest 1.25 billion euros in deprived neighborhoods to improve the building stock, quality of schools and employment opportunities. The idea to try to improve lagging neighborhoods is not new and has been applied in many countries all over the world. Economists are often critical towards the so-called place-based policies because they argue one should help people rather than places. By providing large subsidies to lagging regions, one may actually encourage people to stay in locations that offer little opportunities. Furthermore, because rich and poor are not perfectly segregated, Place-based policies may actually also mean that people are helped that do not need it. Still, when public money may lead to a virtuous cycle, or how economists would refer to it as positive externalities, place-based policies may be preferred over people-based policies. In a paper studying these positive externalities, together with Jos van Ommeren, published in Review of Economic Statistics, we evaluate the so-called Krachtwijken or Vogelaarwijken policy, which was a policy that invested about 1 billion euro in the 83 most deprived neighborhoods between 2007 and 2012 in the Netherlands. The lion's share of this money was meant to improve the quality of the public housing stock. We look at house price changes of surrounding properties and compare neighborhoods that are just selected with neighborhoods that are just not selected. We find that owner-occupied house prices have increased by about 3.5%, indicating that these neighborhoods have become more attractive. In other words, we find evidence that if you invest in one house, this has positive spillovers for surrounding houses. We also made sure to check that public housing rents didn't increase. So low-income households in public housing didn't only benefit from better housing for a similar rent, but also experienced an increase in neighborhood quality. We further made a calculation to compare the total benefits to the surrounding houses to the investments. Unfortunately, the total benefits exceed the costs by a factor one to four. Of course, improving the quality of the building stock in deprived neighborhoods is not a panacea to solve the issue of social deprivation and inequality. But for everyone to live in appropriate housing in decent neighborhoods seemed like a good start. Another recent development that potentially influences the livability of cities is that of short-term rental platforms. One of the most well-known examples of such a platform is Airbnb. Although COVID-19 meant that traveling was hardly possible, we are probably going back to a situation where tourists will flood places like Venice, Amsterdam, and New York. And the demand for tourist accommodation will be as high as before. These cities struggle with the issue that houses are used by tourists rather than by residents, supposedly leading to higher house prices and rents. Some cities already have taken measures and implemented regulations that forbid or limit possibilities to put properties on Airbnb. We measure the effects of Airbnb on the housing market in a paper in the Journal of Urban Economics with Jos van Ommeren and Nicolas Volkhausen for Los Angeles. The interesting thing here is that some municipality in the Los Angeles area limit Airbnb to just 30 days a year, while others did not take any measures. In the first step, we indeed show that these policies are effective as the number of listings reduced by about 30% after implementation of this 30-day limit. In the second step, we compared an adjacent areas with and without regulation to show that Airbnb indeed lead to higher house prices. However, the overall effect is quite small. 
For example, for the whole of LA County, it, Airbnb just meant a 3.5% increase in overall property values. However, for some areas with high listings rates, such as Venice Beach or Hollywood, price and rent increases can be much more substantial. The lesson we learned from this exercise is that Airbnb has effects on the housing market, but only for very particular locations, close to tourist hotspots. In other words, only a very few neighborhoods in Amsterdam are substantially affected by Airbnb. Moreover, I wonder whether forbidding Airbnb altogether is the most effective way forward, as it is very costly to enforce the policy. By contrast, I would prefer to increase the tourist tax for short-term rentals substantially, which is much easier to arrange. In this way, the society benefits from Airbnb through higher tax revenues, but only at locations on which is Airbnb is the most profitable, short-term rentals will occur. Many cities worldwide are threatened by climate change. First, one third of the world's population live in areas that are prone to flood risk and inundation when sea level will rise. Other cities fight against devastated air pollution or increasing temperatures. Although people in cities may be particularly impacted by environmental effects and climate change, it seems unlikely that going back to the countryside is the solution to environmental issues. Based on surveys, urbanites are considerably more energy efficient than their rural counterparts. In the US, urban families drive about 11,000 kilometers less per year because they live closer to work and amenities. Also, urban households seem to consume less energy than rural or suburban ones because heating or cooling apartments is more efficient than doing this for detached properties. Hence, although people in cities are exposed to, for example, more air pollution and the effects of heat waves, urbanization seems an effective way to reduce CO2 emissions and fight climate change. We therefore now look at a couple of policies trying to create sustainable cities. One of the most prominent policies to reduce global CO2 emissions is to invest heavily in the production of renewable energy. This is, at least in the Netherlands, mostly done by the development of wind turbines and solar farms. By 2050, about 50% of the renewable energy should be produced by wind turbines and solar farms on land, which implies that in the coming years, an increasing number of wind turbines and solar farms needs to be constructed. This leads to substantial local opposition because particularly turbines are constructed to are considered to generate negative effects like shadows and flickering, as well as noise and visual pollution of the landscape. Because these costs are borne by people living around these turbines, these should be taken into account when deciding where to put new turbines. However, it is quite hard to come up with a monetary measure of for these costs. Again, we use house prices as these involve a trade-off of people deciding whether and how much they are willing to pay to avoid living near a turbine. Together with Martijn Dreus, we have studied this question in two studies using data on the Dutch housing market and look at price changes after construction of turbines and solar farms. We find that house prices decrease by about 2.5% after the construction of a turbine. But this effect is stronger when turbines are larger and when the property is closer to a turbine. After two kilometers, we do not find a significant effect of turbines anymore. Interestingly, we find that only the first turbine commands a negative price effect. The second or third one within two kilometers does, does not matter. This suggests that it is preferable to cluster turbines rather than putting one turbine here and one turbine there. Maybe surprisingly, we also find some negative effects of about 2% of solar farms, but the effect dissipates within one kilometer, so it's much more local. In a way, the finding of a negative price effect of turbines and solar farms is bad news because it signals that 
People don't like to have those in their backyards. On the other hand, if you make a back of the envelope calculation, we find that for most turbines, the share of losses in housing values amount to about 10% of construction costs. While there are just 25 turbines that cause 50% of the total loss in housing values in the Netherlands. Hence, this shows that it really, really matters where turbines are constructed. These should not be built close to build-up areas. Another policy to keep cities sustainable and livable is by restricting the border of cities and be very critical towards any development that takes place in these restricted areas. In the Netherlands, we have such a policy since the 1950s, where we protect a vast green space in the middle of the four largest cities, the green heart. In, in other countries, often green belts around cities are protected. A particularly telling example is England, where 13% of the land is designated as green belt lands. In principle, new development is not allowed on greenbelt lands. Henceforth, cities like London or Birmingham are of about the same size in terms of land coverage as 75 years ago. On the one hand, protecting green areas around cities seem like a good idea. People can enjoy these areas when recreating and views from one's house on green space are typically appreciated. I refer to this effect as the amenity effect of green space. On the other hand, green belts also imply that there is less land available for development. This means that there may be excess demand, implying high house prices throughout the city that is restricted by a green belt. I refer to the latter effect as a supply effect. In a recent study, I set up a general equilibrium model to be able to verify the trade-off between these two effects. I actually find that the amenity effect is about the same size as the supply effect. Whether green belts increase or decrease welfare depends on how e easy it is to build houses in higher densities in the city. To put it differently, it is fine to have a green belt or a green heart, but then it must be relatively easy to build taller apartment buildings in the city. In the Netherlands, policies aim to build about 1 million homes in the next 10 years to address the strong drop in housing affordability. There are now ongoing discussions on whether these properties should be developed within the city limits or whether they should be greenfield development outside the city. There is then definitely room to apply the before mentioned model to the green heart in the Netherlands. This is relevant as the amenity effect as well as the housing supply elasticity are likely different for, than for England. By the way, I also investigated whether green belts lead to lower air pollution, as they could be seen as green lungs of a city. Unfortunately, I do not find that green belts imply a reduction in pollution in areas close to green belts. In the last part of this talk, I would like to discuss some policy interventions trying to improve accessibility of cities. The way in which we travel has changed dramatically in the last 100 to 150 years. With the invention of the car, people could easily live further away from their jobs and commute to work in the city. Pooley and Turnbull show that the commuting distance has increased from about 3.5 kilometers in 1900 to 15 kilometers 100 years later. At the same time, the speed of traveling also has more than doubled. Before COVID, Dutch people spend on average more than a week per year on their way to work. During COVID, we have seen that this dipped, but slowly roads and trains become more congested again. In a recent paper with Francis Ostermeyer, Victor Newson, and Jos van Ommeren, we use an instrumental variables approach to test the impact of car ownership on population density, using worldwide data on 232 cities from all over the world. We find that cities with a higher share of car owners are much more spread out. More specifically for a standard deviation increase in car ownership, the population density decreases by 35%. So the effect is substantial. This has strong implications for cities in developing countries. 
where we expect strong car ownership increases in the near future. This will inevitably lead to more spread out cities and potentially even more traffic congestion. It also means that if we impose taxes on cars so that driving becomes more expensive, this has implications on how far people want to live from their work. As already discussed before, more compact cities tend to be more envir environmentally friendly. So raising taxes for the car is also favorable from the point of view of the environment. Cars in the city do not only use roads, but also have to park somewhere. Parking is an often overlooked topic, but parking spaces comprise a non-negligible share of urban space. Because land is not free, it makes sense to let people pay for using a parking space. But Professor Jos van Ommeren is the real parking expert here. And he already argued that residents are implicitly subsidized by paying very little for a parking permit in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, the subsidy is, for example, more than 85%. So when municipalities will raise parking prices for residents, this means that fewer people may want to use the car and the traffic and traffic congestion may be weakened. In order to confirm this hypothesis, we study the impact of parking prices on traffic, together with Francis Ostermeyer, Jos van Ommeren, Leonardo Nunez. We exploit the recent increase in parking prices in Amsterdam for visitors. Prices have increased by 60% and Amsterdam charges now the highest price for visitors in the world. We find that parking demand de decreased by about 17%. Interestingly, the increased parking prices also have led to a decrease in traffic of two to 3%. This may seem small, but note that most of the traffic is by residents and employees who park off streets at their workplaces. What we learn from this is that parking prices are a second best policy to reduce traffic externalities in city. Particularly in historic cities like Amsterdam, Utrecht and The Hague, where it is very expensive to provide wider roads and parking spaces, increasing substantially the cost of parking for residents and workers seem like a welfare increasing policy. So far, I mostly talked about policies that have an impact on within city traffic. However, also the cost of long distance travel has, have been reduced dramatically in the last decades. This is mostly because of airplanes. As we know, airplanes are very quick, but not very sustainable to say the least. Probably the only sustainable alternative on medium distances, up to 800 kilometers, are high-speed trains that run over 250 kilometers an hour. In the last two decades, we have seen a surge in the construction of high-speed rail lines. For example, in Europe, in 2000, there were just less than 3,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. But in 2017, this increased to more than 9,000 kilometers. The developments in China are even more staggering. In just 13 years, China created an efficient high-speed rail network of over 35,000 kilometers, essentially linking all major cities in China. The first proper high-speed rail line was opened in Japan in 1964 between Tokyo and Osaka. Japan's Shinkansen network is now over 3,000 kilometers and is known as one of the most successful and efficient high-speed rail networks in the world. To pick Japan to study the long-term effects of high-speed rail on the spatial distribution of employment therefore seems to make sense. In a first paper together with Jacques Tis and Takatabuchi, we study the effects of being connected to the network, to the high-speed rail network, for what we refer to as intermediate places. These places are not main cities that were the reason to construct a Shinkansen line in the first place, like Tokyo or Osaka. Using a theoretical model, we argue that these intermediate places may benefit from the better connection because of lower transportation costs to people. But at the same time, they may lose because of more intense competition. Let me illustrate this with an example from the Netherlands. The Hazel Zuid, 
connected Amsterdam and Breda and onto Antwerp and Brussels. Breda is a rather small city with a population of about 180,000. On the one hand, Breda could have benefited from the high-speed rail line because it is now cheaper to transport people and services to Amsterdam. On the other hand, before the connection, firms may have had headquarters in Amsterdam and say a regional headquarters in Breda. Now it may be cheaper to close down the regional headquarters in Breda and just transfer people from Amsterdam to Breda. If the latter effect dominates, Breda may actually be worse off due to the high-speed rail line connection. Back to Japan. We use about 60 years of data at the municipality level on employment and the opening of Shinkansen stations to show that in between places indeed lose from a connection, from a station. The loss in local employment is quite sizable and up to 30%. In a follow-up paper, we study the general equilibrium effects of the development of the Shinkansen network. We gather data on firm relations, commuting, employment and population to show that larger cities, larger cities have generally benefited from being linked to the Shinkansen network. Due to lower transportation costs of people, the Shinkansen has led Japan's economy to be about 5% more productive. In this talk, I discussed several policies affecting deliverability, sustainability, and accessibility of cities, with some policies affecting all three of them at the same time. The takeaway here is that policies matter and have a discernible effect on how cities look like and function. Urban policies are paramount because they let cities be able to reinvent themselves so that they are resilient and ready for the future. Although economists are working on, on issues of policy evaluation, if there is anything that, should re you, re that you should remember from this talk, it, it is that I think we should evaluate economic and social policies more rigorously. While cost-benefit analysis is now an integral part of large spatial policies, that's before, right? I think it makes sense to also make an ex post analysis of the results of a policy, say, after 10, 15 years. I think that should be an absolute requirement. Sure, predicting the future is hard, also for maybe particularly for economists. So learning about the past to not make the same mistakes in the future is probably the best we can do. Dear Rector Magnificus, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm reaching the end of this lecture. Still, I would like to thank a number of people. In the first place, I would like to thank the executive board of the Vrije Universiteit and the board of the School of Business and Economics for this appointment and the confidence placed in me. Almost all research discussed today is a joint venture. Actually, my job is really much more fun because it enables me to work with a variety of people from different countries and cultures which lead almost every day to new insights, better analyses, and more interesting papers. I'm not going to mention all those people here, but really, all the work was not possible without my co-authors. Also, my colleagues at the Department of Space Economics should be mentioned here. It's a great pleasure to work at a department where so many people are interested in similar obscure topics as I am. Moreover, despite the competitive academic environment, it is quite comforting how well people generally get along and are happy to share their data and ideas. A special thank you here is in place for Eric Verhoef, who has been leading the department very smoothly in the last eight years or so. Further, I want to mention three other special people here. First, I want to specifically thank Jos, who has been my PT supervisor a long time ago, almost by accident. If I remember well, 10 years ago, Jos came in my room, still on the 14th floor, to ask something on fixed effects or standard errors or something else very interesting. And well, here are we now. We have almost finished 16 papers ever since. It's always great fun to work with you and I hope we can do keep doing so in the future. Second, I want to mention Jacques Thies here. I got to know Jacques about eight years ago on a conference in Germany. Since then, we worked on a couple of papers on income sorting and high-speed drill. 
Because I'm a simple empiricist, I still learn every day from his insights on economic theory, as well as from the history of Belgium and the Low Countries. Jacques also invite, invited me a few years ago to join the Higher School of Economics in St. Petersburg, where I'm still a leading research fellow ever since. A final thank you is from my life partner, Mark. Usually this is a place and time where the speaker apologizes for working too many hours and being away too much. But this does not apply in my case. We have been home together for most of the last two years where I noticed that I, I cannot compete with Mark in terms of working hours and dedication to work. Still, it's, it is great to have someone who is happy to hear my boring stories about paper rejections, data, and econometric analysis. It's just absolutely astonishing how well we get along despite two years of COVID, and I'm very thankful for that. Ik heb gezegd. Let me first of all uh, congratulate Hans, Mark and family with, uh, with your appointment, um, as well as your colleagues um, as, uh, as a new member, or a new member, as a new professor member of the department. Uh, and also I would like to, to thank myself in a way, uh, as the School of Business Economics, that we have been able to, uh, to uh, keep you in, uh, in our school because you're a member of a very strong department. I think most of the people here might know that, but I just want to emphasize that as far as regional economics is concerned and, and uh, uh, urban economics is part of that in a way, um, we are probably the strongest, I'm, not, I'm sure, we are the strong, have the strongest department in the Netherlands. And I think that's really a compliment. And uh, well, you already indicated, you gave many, many examples of, of studies that to kind of illustrate why that is the case. It's high quality work, highly relevant work, well-cited, uh, very influential. So uh, we, I think it's very good to have this department in our school and you now as a full professor in that department. Um, well, as far as urban economics is concerned, I must admit that it's really not really my piece of cake because I'm a country boy. So I'm already kind of now fantasizing about the next chair, village economics. Um, and I already see kind of someone st standing here having reinventing villages, uh, evaluating uh, the effectiveness of rural policy. So uh, just, just your suggestion. So let me know when I can do something in that respect. Um, ik ga nu over weer tot het Nederlands en ik sluit deze uh, zitting. We komen aan het einde van deze bijeenkomst nog een enkele mededeling. Ik verzoek u straks bij het verlaten van de zaal voorrang te verlenen aan diegenen die op de eerste rijen zijn gezeten, zodat zij direct achter de cortège de zaal kunnen verlaten. Opdat ik deze openbare vergadering van het college van decanen kan sluiten met het uitspreken van de lofverheffing, verzoek ik u allen te gaan staan. De naam des heren zij geprezen van nu aan tot in eeuwigheid.